Well, hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. If you don't already know who I am, uh, my name is Janine Miaton, and I'm the events programming manager here at Meetup. So excited for this event uh, with Tatiana Kolovu. Did I say it right? Very well. Super. <laughs> who will teach us how to curate a powerful and provocative presence. Um, Tatiana will walk us through essential verbal and nonverbal behaviors uh, to increase likability, uh, persona building with the focus on warmth and competence, as well as off-putting practices to avoid so that you fully engage others and stand out in a crowd. I am like so excited for this. Um, so before we get started, I'm going to go over the guidelines in the agenda, and then I'm quickly going to pass it on to Tatiana. Uh, Tatiana. So for those of you that are here, uh, don't worry. Sorry, give me one second. What did I just do? I feel like I just... Okay, this event is recorded. Got it. This event is recorded, but do not worry. You will not appear on video. And with that said, since the event is recorded, if you join, if anyone joins later, has to leave early or wants, simply wants to rewatch this, which I will, you can uh, download, no, not download, you can access uh, a recap in the recording of this event on our blog at meetup.com slash blog. Um, everyone is also muted with the exception of myself and Tatiana, although I'm sure some of you probably do want me to be muted at this point. Um, with that said, we do encourage you to ask questions. Uh, if you can just submit your questions in the Q&A feature at the bottom of the screen, we will ask some of them uh, during the Q&A portion at the end of uh, this, this event. Uh, and closed captioning is available. Thank you to Zoom. So if you want to turn it on, you can just click these, uh, you can simply click on the live transcription icon at the bottom of the screen and select your preference. Um, and just quickly, I just did the opening remarks. Tatiana's going to take it away, introduce herself, and dive into her presentation. And like I said, for the last 15 minutes of the event, we're going to do Q&A. So if you have any questions, please submit them in the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. And I will do my best to get through most of the questions. Thank you, Tatiana. Take it away. Absolutely. All right. Let me get to my screen share. Hi, everyone. I wanted to uh, be very cognizant of our time. Our topic is the power of presence, and I hope that you leave here with a few nuggets of information that will make your presence more effective and more, uh, I would say, attention getting and getting a job, a talk, uh, a sign checked or anything you want it to be. So as we get started, a huge thanks and shout out to Meetup. They have been running after me, I think since the summer, and I've been traveling and teaching and very unattentive. And I wanted to say thanks for your uh, very, very much your energy and your trust in, in me. Uh, I'm a professor. I just finished actually with my MBA students and I'm in my office. So you may hear a little bit of echo. I teach at Indiana University, Bloomington. My email is there if you need to reach out and if you have any questions. So I teach um, on undergrads or MBAs, executive education. I have several certifications, but the one thing that I think I've had the most impact on learning has been a involvement for the last, uh, what about eight or nine years. It started with a company called lynda.com. And when LinkedIn acquired them, the rest was history. But today I'm here to talk to you about you being in front of other people. I teach presentations, but the reality is before people decide what they think of your message, if you're speaking, they decide what they think of you. So some of you may have jumped in today and saw me and I may have a little bit of an accent and you're like, oh gosh, I'm not, I can't follow her. Or you say, oh, she wears glasses. She may be older. Oh, I want to follow her. And I want to hear what she says. We make an impression on people immediately. And that's why our first opening lines in a one-on-one -on -one conversation and a presentation are critical. They're very important because they depend on the specific uh, models of what we call human social perception called warmth and competence. So warmth means, do I like a person, the likability factor that Janine talked about, do I trust them? Do I want to follow them? And obviously afterwards comes competence. Can this person follow along? So the ones of you on the career tracks, you may be thinking, do I communicate that warmth and competence? But I'd like you to think about in your mind, since this is a webinar, we can have you vote. Out of the two, when someone meets you for the first time, do you think that they make their decision based on warmth or based on competence? 
take a couple minutes. Do they make the decision based on warmth, based on competence? So the answer is warmth is the first thing that we judge because the warmth carries the weight of our judgments when deciding whether we trust someone. So it's really trust that takes over that first impression. And I hate to say this, this is pretty biased, right? Because other experiences and beliefs and background um, uh, upbringing and concepts, I just uh, finished writing some content on cultural humility. In order to be culturally humble, we have to be as unbiased as possible but sometimes it happens automatically. But no, when people are making impressions of you, that the warmth is what has to come up through. And that's why we'll talk about nonverbals being important, anywhere from gestures and smile and facial expression and posture, all very important. So let me show you this really interesting um, graph. And this is out of a Cornell study that was published uh, one of the publishers is Amy Cuddy. You may know her on her power of presence and her very popular TED talk. But if you think about the X and Y scale of competence and warmth, if we put warmth on the bottom and then uh, competence on the top, uh, sorry, warmth on, on the left and competence on the top, someone that is uh, has very low competence, uh, for example, my children, when they were two and three and four, very high warmth, super cute, but you don't want them running around the house with scissors in their hands or staying away from the stairs because they can't manage stairs too well anymore. And then you have people that are low competence and low warmth. And those are the people we reject and we don't want to be around at all. Think about the quick impressions that you make when you're driving. I don't know about you, but my, I would say my, imp my, my biases are really quick or I make quick assumptions about people when I'm in the car. So they don't turn on a signal. I want nothing to do with them. Not only are they incompetent, but I don't want them to be my friend. So then we have that um, envy and, and, uh, and grudging comp um, cooperation sort of like a push and pull. And we probably have felt this with bosses that have been very good at what they do, but they have zero warmth. They never ask you anything about your life. They don't disclose anything about theirs. They seem not to have any humanity in the way that they communicate. And that's probably a quadrant we don't wanna be in. So where we aspire to be in is that high competence and high warmth. The section of admiration and attraction. And a lot of it is likability, it's authenticity, it's that connection of, of being sincere, but being yourself when no one is looking. So that's a hard thing to judge. And all of us now are in, in a virtual environment and quite often people put up versions of themselves on social media that is not really who they are. Uh, I don't know if you have Be Real, but today I was in class and I, I take my only follower on Be Real is my daughter. <laughs> Maybe I don't want to be communicating with her or many of her friends specifically, but I do think that that app is made, is made popular because of that. So if you think of that warmth and competence and how it, it comes together, we really need to think of, of our presence and what we bring as we come into the room. I have uh, a young woman in, uh, in my life, my daughter, Melina is 21, and I've always taught her that her presence is sort of this invisible cloak, this, this powerful way that she presents each other, she's comfortable with, uh, but she also finds genuine to herself. Because if you saw the gentleman in the suit and sort of putting up an act and maybe going to a conference or being in a setting, you want the presence that you cultivate to be authentic to you. That's really important. And you may not have guessed it yet, but I'm definitely an extrovert and I get in trouble sometimes. I may talk more than I should. I may say something before I've really thought about it. That may be a little overbearing in larger settings. I'm aware of that. So I try to be mindful that my presence sometimes is stronger than it should be. And so I'll try to tone it down. The same thing, my business partner is an introvert. In fact, we have a course on LinkedIn Learning on introversion and extroversion. She talks about having to step in the shoes of the persona of a bigger presence when she is conducting a workshop or when she's running an interview or running a meeting. Definitely the difference there is not social skill, as you probably know, it's how you need to replenish your energy. So enough about that, but on the same topic of LinkedIn learning courses, I'm gonna do a, a shameless brag because what I will talk to you about today is specifically in a course called 
managing or, or delivering an authentic pitch. And here I am with a young man um, on the left, you see what's in that, in that course. But in this demonstration, and this is a true story, one of my MBA students, um, a lot of our MBA students work on what they call the tell me, tell me about you pitch, or not pitch, or description. So when companies, this young man was interviewing at that time, I think with uh, John Deere, the company that makes farming equipment, he was from Iowa and he was an engineer that wanted to go into, I think it was uh, supply chain and working specifically with agricultural companies. And he came to me and practiced his, tell me a little bit about you pitch, which I kind of designed this course around that. And I'm reenacting that with this young man. And he was going through his resume. He was going through things that were so easy to read on a sheet of paper. But I told him, and as I tell all of our students and executives, you need to mine something out of your personal experience that is memorable, that people will not forget. And in that case, I said to him, okay, this sounds like a resume. Tell me a little bit about why agriculture and what's the connection there? Why you and this topic? And we came up, he didn't, it didn't come up. He said, well, I spent each and every one of my summers riding on a tractor with my grandpa in the hot Iowa weather. And I said, stop the presses. We need to put that in your pitch. And that's the example that we use with this young man where we talk about a personal and real reason why he's interested in that job in that company. Some of you may be here and be thinking, I'm just here socially attending. But you know what? When you introduce yourself to someone or where you are wanting to become part of a group or a community, that authenticity has to come across. And that's where warmth is important. So let's go back a little bit and think of what is presence. I talked about authenticity, your authentic brand your projection of that competence and warmth, depending on the audience and depending on the context. Then your ability to deliver compelling and memorable messages. So if you're speaking, because sometimes you can have and de demonstrate your presence only in non-verbals, maybe your attendance in a meeting, but if you have something to say, it should be memorable and it should be compelling and you need to do your homework. Another thing is really your ability to read your audience and your ability to use audience depending on relevant body language. This setting is not easy because I don't get any feedback from you all. I see Emily's little hand be risen and I see Janine's picture and that's all I get. So I have to guess that you're sitting at your desks, sipping on your wine if you're in Europe or if you're in another part of the world. Thank you for waking up early to watch this. But I'm trying to connect. And one of the questions that I asked both um, of my young, uh, my uh, lady colleagues was, who is the audience and, and what might they be doing as they're watching this? Because it's important that I, I, I'm energetic enough to keep you wanting to, to listen more. And why is that important? Well, that's important because we communicate with verbals and nonverbals. So today we'll talk about competence as it relates to warmth in a nonverbal and verbal way of how we communicate it and competence in nonverbal and verbal. So one more thing is I don't want you to think competence is, think of it as sort of your expertise. What do you bring to the table? What do you bring to the group specifically? Even if it's social or even if it's work related to as well. You may have seen this again and again, UCLA, um, professor, Dr. Albert Morabian did a study that said a message communicated from me to you comes across 55% in the words that a person says, 38% in the nonverbals, or I would say, sorry, not nonverbals. Sorry, let me, let, me, let me move the slide back. It threw me off. 55% is body language. So it's leaning in a virtual call. It's me turning my ear and demonstrating that I'm listening. Is if I'm listening, I'm nodding. I'm using my hands, but not parking the plane. I'm very specific. 38% is your intonation of your voice or the pauses that you add or the energy that you increase the speed of your voice, or maybe you slow it down some. And then a short little seven are the words that you say. So if you think about this, 55% and 38% are non-vocalics, they are non-word related, this 93% of a message comes across in non-verbals. So I can say all to you right now, you got it? Do you sign up? I wish I could see your thumbs because you would say, yes, 
sign me up. And I said, let's go, everyone. Let's jump off the balcony. Greek is my first language. And I said it in an enthusiastic way. And I used my hand gestures and I changed the intonation. And you said, yep, sign me up. Well, don't go doing anything dangerous, just following the intonation in my body language. So before the webinar started, we talked about walking in the room like a boss, kind of how you enter a room does communicate that presence. And I love the office for all of its different analogies that it had. But Michael had a way of just using urgency and importance and, and just a, a, a credibility, even though he did not know what he was doing. We have the little kitty cat that's walking like a boss. Kitty cats always make us happy. But we also have a young woman there who is entering with a smile. And we'll talk a little bit about uh, how, what smile does specifically. The number one leadership uh, component, and I'll share the feedback, the research with you a little bit here, is how you sit and how you listen and how you use your body, whether you're standing, whether you're sitting, whether you're holding a drink in your hand, posture is really important. You want to look relaxed, but you want to look attentive and engaged, and that's really important. Let me show you where this research comes from. A book stand out. Carol Goman is one of the LinkedIn instructors. Fantastic. And she talks about an Ohio State uh, survey where people were the way that you stood really also and sat at your desks uh, related to how they accepted their own uh, written statements as being valid. That's really important. Amy Cuddy in her TED Talk talks a lot about how we use our posture that communicates that uh, to us and others too. But posture is a really big problem in today's society. And I don't know about you, but these are some of the products, if you've seen them, that remind you to sit up straight. And I think this is a man bra that some people wear to stand up but I'm not gonna ask you to go and buy any of those and I don't get permission. I don't get uh, any, any uh, kickbacks from the companies. But I want to stop here and have you do something active. I learned it from my physical therapist and it's a fantastic demonstration of what happens with gravity. So I'm gonna demonstrate this on my side. You didn't think that there would be activities in this, Janine, did you? So I want you to put two fingers on your lips here and just kind of mark where your head is at this point. Then I want you to leave the fingers where they are, and I want you to retract, that's the correct word, to where your ears and your shoulders are in line. This is what we call a neutral spine, so drawing a line from the top of your head down your spine, and this is where your head is most of the time. So we're texting, we're driving, we're writing, we're cooking, we're doing all this stuff in the plane that drags our body forward. And no wonder when we walk into the room, we may look like we're measly and embarrassed and don't wanna be seen. We also don't look very well. We think this is how we look in virtual calls. And the reality is that we look a little less, uh, I would say modelish in the way that people are here. So if there's anything else right now, you see me, you see how far I am from my chair. I'm not sitting down to present this, in fact, if I had just not finished class and I could be in my home office, I usually do these webinars standing. It's really important that you can communicate that energy. We have gone and given feedback to CFOs in annual analyst calls where they, or quarterly analyst calls, where they have to really crush it to convince analysts that they need to, the stock that is, is valuable and everyone needs to buy the stock. And the reality is that the ones that are sitting have much lower energy than the ones that are standing, even though nobody could see them. It's an audio call. Posture is critical. So is eye contact, friends. You know this. I know you know this. And for the ones of you that think a lot and look up, that's okay if you're taking a question, as long as it doesn't happen for a long time. But eye to eye phone uh, eye contact is important. Now, a few things. These things are very distracting. So when you go into a meeting and you want to demonstrate high warmth, eye contact will get you there. However, I see that you have come in from many parts of the world and I want to ensure you, you know very well, I'm from Greece. If you maintain eye contact for too long, you either may be considered intimidating or it may come across as being flirtatious. I take students over to Greece quite often and I tell them don't continue with the eye contact on the train because there will be boys following us to the hotel and I have to go out and go, no, no, it's not what you thought. So depending on the content and the context, 
A challenging thing a lot of times is doing this and maintaining eye contact on a virtual call, exhausting. One of the strategies that I use quite often, I say, well, I wanna make sure that I captured some of what we said. So I'm gonna be taking some notes and I may kind of move the notepad around, but looking at my notes and holding the pen up a little to break eye contact a little bit and keep it from really exhausting me, especially if you are online quite often. A little bit of research, because I'm coming to you from a university. This was, I think I said the research study before was from Cornell. That was Ohio State. This is Cornell. They did this research by putting a, um, a checks box, a tricks box cereal. This is cereal that in the United States people eat in the morning with milk. And the bunny was looking away on the first box and at the person in the second box. And they just had people uh, list away which one they decided they liked the most to be sitting on their kitchen table. I'm not kidding you. I'm not making this up. And people voted for the bunny. It's not even a person. It's a bunny. So we know that we want that eye contact. And with eye contact, you're communicating a presence, a strong presence. Now, this is not new. Posture is important. Some kind of level of graceful and diplomatic eye contact but you do know that people read faces, not the most popular person in the, in the world right now, um, and um, a least popular person if you're coming in from Germany. I try to hit all the different uh, politics and business, and on the bottom left is uh, Howard Dean, a politician that nearly made it to uh, being running for, for uh, president of the US. Very animated, or by, by using animations, they show that they um, are communicating with that. And that's really important. So facial expressions, my friends, are critical. And you need to videotape yourself. Again, another great tool that we have that you can videotape yourself. So people, you know what you look like, especially when you're listening. Posture, we talked about eye contact. We talked about facial expressions. And if you've ever seen this little video, you can't hear it. And I'm not gonna say he's being videotaped and they say, he says, I don't know what to do with my hands. So his hands keep rising. And he does a terrible job by trying to hold the microphone. And they say, put your hands down. And then his name is Ricky Bobby. So he has two different names. If you find yourself in front of an audience, our body instinctively tries to protect itself. So we end up, I just was doing presentations with my students. People sit like this. They do what we call spider in the mirror. They do the steeple or they wring their hands or they're nervous. They play with their rings and do other things. You never see the news anchors do that. So relaxing your hands in a neutral position and using them in ways that don't uh, distract the audience is important. When we stand, we usually do the fig leaf with our hands in front of us. Or we do the at ease that's from the army, or we do the basketball hold. You see a lot of people speaking, or they hold the basket. It's narrow or it's wide. Or the worst one, especially when you're standing, is the T Rex. You get people that stand in front and they say, Today I'm going to talk about a very big problem. And when your elbows are Velcroed in your ribs, you are not gesturing. I don't care if the timeline is long, I don't care if the project is, is a high impact. However you gesture, it's going to be limited and that makes it difficult. When you are in this screen, make sure you're not gesturing outside. But I tell my students they can gesture forward. They can use their body to lean and communicate that. Well, Mark Cuban, if you don't know who he is, he's on Shark Tank, but he is one of our biggest uh, bad boy of business alums, and we always talk about him. But I tell our students, you don't want to be over-exaggerated like he is. He owns a basketball team, and he gets very excited when they win or lose. But you want to communicate whether you are uh, intense or whether you're concerned or whether that you're happy and so on. So we talked about nonverbals from a warmth and competence standpoint. You want to look well put together. You want to communicate and not have a poker face. You want to have some gestures. You want to use and have good posture. There's one more thing that connects to a story that I want to share with you. And again, it relates to basketball. You have to be in the Midwest to know who this person is. I'm going to have you guess. While I take a strategic sip of water, because I'm the only one talking, this was a very famous basketball coach by the name of Bobby Knight. And he was the basketball coach of the Indiana basketball team 
for many, many years. So when I was an undergrad at Indiana, I came to Indiana University for my undergraduate. I took a course. I was intrigued by his popularity. He had, talk about that high competence, low warmth. He was there. I think he was off the charts because he was so strict and stern. And he talked, uh, taught a course on the uh, coaching of basketball. I was a swimmer. I was not a basketball player. I would go <laughs> to the labs. I would go to class for his lectures, but then the labs were on the basketball court and I would cut to the back of the line all the time because I could not shoot a basket to save my life. But he told a story one day that made me think that your presence is carried by more than all of this, but it's also the things around you. And many of you know this, but he said, I ask my student managers to take care of my team. And these are young men, it was men's team, so it's usually men that he hired that were students eager to work with one of the best basketball coaches of all time. And they asked, um, he would say at the end of the interview, uh, John, let me walk you to your car. So you would see John taking his keys and putting them away and saying, oh, coach, uh, I took the bus. Or uh, young men would say, I've parked really far away. You don't want to walk that far away. The reason that he wanted to see their cars, he said, I had zero interest on how expensive or how new they were, but I wanted to see their cars because how they took care of their cars would communicate to me how they would take care of my team. I wanted the car to be clean and I wanted it to be neat inside. So think about this. Your presence is not just your body language and gestures and communication, but maybe the, the rattiness of a bag that you carry, the, the cracks on your phone as you pull it up to make an appointment, just little things that may communicate something about you. And so how uh, the artifacts that we say make impressions or don't. And here are some of our students that we have them dress, you know, dress is another way for people to make an impression on warmth and competence and so related to the content. And that's really important that you're mindful with that. So I wanted to touch upon because we're in a webinar and this is more of a, an online setting that you may be in quite a lot. I do want to point out, Janine, we're holding on and I have my eye on that on the number of, uh, of, uh, of learners and members and organizers that are hanging in there. So that's great of everyone that's there. Um, this is, this is a, a great post uh, by um, a person that's on um, Shane Snow that talks about making sure that your v verbal uh, communication online doesn't make you look like a, a convicted felon here. So minding objects in the background. So these are things that could distract or affect your competence. Uh, looking that like you belong to a um, hostage video or having distracting things coming from the back of your head, you may want to follow him on LinkedIn and communicate that, uh, uh, learn a little bit about that. Another really good resource is uh, by this author, Doug, I'm, I'm copying this to you, Doug Post, he, he does a whole video on how to set things up. And this started maybe in the beginning of, of COVID when we were very mindful about it. And it was uh, continued and it's really important that you make sure you have the right lighting and the light is at the level, uh, cameras at the level of your eyes. So all of this that influences how people perceive us and how important it is to communicate some of that warmth and competence. If you remember, I talked about 55% being your nonverbals, but 38% is your vocal, your vocalics and your intonation. And I want to tell you another story of something that happened to me early in the days of lynda.com. I receive, and we all receive feedback, and it's very visible, and it doesn't get uh, sifted through too much. And this person gave me a high remark, and my content manager called me on this one and said, I have a an interesting comment that came through, and I'm not sure if it's positive or negative, but I'll share it with you anyway. And this person said this, now I'll remind you, if you're not familiar in LinkedIn learning, there's courses where people communicate. And I think this was a course on, on de de delivering presentations. So um, good explanations, helpful strategies. As a rule, as a rule, listen everyone, whether regardless of your uh, of your gender. I do not usually benefit from listening and watching women speakers. Most often males are easier to listen to and they get right to the point without what I refer to as distracting baby talk. This made me angry. Uh, whichever, they wish, whichever they wish to interject personal thought and emotion. I think you can communicate thought and emotion without baby talk and you can have babies and have a channel where you can speak to them and then have a conversation in a business setting. 
this particular author was informative and easy to follow along with. <laughs> My blood was boiling when I read this because it said to me that people's first impressions quite often, and all of the students that we try to coach and send out in the work world, really have to overcome some of this. And quite often, many of them have maybe lived with a group of people that did op talk all the time and they pick up on that. Or like I came such as when I first came to the United States, I went back to Greece and my friend said, you've become very Americanized. And I said, why do you say that? And the response was, because you say like when you don't mean to. And I was assimilating and trying to do that. But back to when we are speaking in our verbals, tone, volume, remember 38% influences that. Inflection and pitch, your pauses or the silence that you use, those are very important. The emphasis that you use on certain words, and if you're reading from a PowerPoint or a teleprompter, make that bold or yellow so you remember and practice emphasizing your rate of speech, and I'll show you some apps and some tricks if you can measure it. And again, your use of fillers or non-fillers. All of that communicates competence, but your ability also in the words that you say, if you say you, I want to say organizers and members and members of the community, social, I asked what are the references of the audience members here? And this is important. This in the United States is quite the problem. I know we have quite a big audience here, an international audience, but the Valley Girl to Up Talk at the end of the sentence, remember that a lot of us may be outside of the US and we try to assimilate and we try to pick up on what we hear. I recommend you don't do that because that defers to lower competence specifically. So don't ask a question unless you mean it. Also, lots of fillers. Being able to pause a filler or pretend that you're thinking and take a sip of water and gather your thoughts and slow down your pace a little bit. All of that communicates competence. I want to pause also and say that if you are speaking in a social setting and you tend to be very energetic and uh, have up talk all the time, sometimes that's authenticity. You have to find the best, the best balance that communicates who you are, but be able to have a dial when you turn it down and up depending on where you are. This is not a joke. My daughter had an English honors teacher that I talked to on the phone and she said that the assignment was due at this specific time and it was important that it was turned in on time. And I hung up the phone and said to my husband, I think Kim Kardashian is our daughter's honors English high school teacher. I think there's a mistake. So it was because she was creaking with her voice. And again, this does not communicate competence. Listen to how you sound back to being able to audio tape and videotape yourselves and get some direct feedback. As I say direct feedback and honest feedback, open up all of the information that you have. Here are three apps that will help you do that. Ori is one, and there's a cost for that, but it gives you energy, it counts the fillers, and it gives you feedback with an artificial intelligence. Not one person is giving you this. Another app is called Like So. It literally gives you a grade. It gives you a topic what you should be studying. And it says, speak for two minutes on the importance of nutrition, or it would say, tell us about your weekend. And no one is listening, but the artificial intelligence is listening for rate of speech and everything else. And the one that I'm the biggest super fan of, and I can tell you because I know the young man who has de designed it and it continues to improve. The same with Ori, very innovative, but Udly is at no cost. Udly.ai, you can put it in the chat if you'd like, Janine, that would be helpful. So Udly uh, gives you feedback on rate of speaking, numbers of Oz, weak words such as so and you know, and uh, there are some others that I use sometimes specifically that you want to be very mindful of and very cognizant because that does take, especially in a virtual setting, People may pay more attention to the words and that may hurt your competence and may have you come along across as not being as competent. I say this all. And also one thing I want to say that I'm in my office. If I pick up the phone, there's absolutely no nonverbals. 80%, 80% of what I say is communicated by my tone of voice and 20% are the words that you say. 
You may have one question right now, and that may be what happens when you write an email. Really good question if you're thinking about that. There's a great uh, course on LinkedIn Learning called Digital Body Language that goes through emoticon use and specific use with how you are communicating with your sentences. The good thing with email that we can pause and read it and reread it and read it out loud and uh, spell check it and do all those fantastic things. When we are speaking and when it's live like this, this is when we can get into more trouble. So I want you to practice, I'm not sure if we're sharing slides, but when you meet someone in general and they say, tell me a little bit about you or tell me about your career, tell me about your business, uh, tell me about your work or what do you do? What do you like to do? Your favorite hobby? I want you to think about who is asking, who is at the audience, maybe not just how you can be authentic, but how does the information you share relate to them? We call it audience analysis and communication. And it's critical that you can uh, customize specifically to your audience and either up the warmth, because in some settings that are social, no one is judging you on your degrees or what your skills are and what you are. It's more warmth. But when you're at work and you're speaking in a meeting, you need to bump up the competence. There's some really great articles that I could share with this that I give to my students. So you're always thinking of connection and you're always thinking of what matters and what's most important to them. So be thinking about these questions and how would you design your pitch to be more or also both warmth and both competence. My recommendation is to always finish as you can say, well, I got into this field or what brings me here or find different introductions as you do those, but always at the end, connect to the audience. You may say something like, so what brings you here or related to, um, I hear, by the way, if you're in the career interest group and you are speaking to someone, you have an interest in a job, you can say, I read in the news that lately your company did this. Tell me how that was communicated in your office or something specific. So do your homework so you can be well prepared to start a conversation. This is why you want to communicate with competence and warmth. Remember that it is your superpower, not just your power, your presence is your superpower. So go out there, practice it and use it. And remember the, the invisible cloak that I gave uh, my, my daughter when she was young and she remembers it as well now too. I leave you with a request and a invitation to connect with me on LinkedIn. If you'd like what you hear, I have a newsletter. It's called Stronger. How do you come across stronger in situations that are trickier? In October, we'll talk about managing energy all the way from introversion, extroversion to what you eat and how you move and how you, you balance and manage that specifically too. So I'm trying to be cognizant of my time and I think I allotted a little bit more time on Q&A, Janine, if, you, uh, if that's okay. If you wanna jump on board, I see we've got 31 questions in the chat or in the Q&A and I'm ready for them now. Thank you to all for being so attentive listeners. Okay, I'm back. Sorry. Let me just fix my screen so that I can see the questions and then ask you the questions. Oh, okay. Oh. Uh, I know I have one screen. Okay. Um, where did I put the questions? Okay. So the first question that I have, uh, sorry, is from Sandy. Um, so you know how you talked about posture and there was a device on someone's back, what on the lady's back, what is the device that was on? Oh her God, back? I don't know, but I've seen it. <laughs> it's advertised a lot. I would link, I, I don't, I just have seen the, the fact that these devices are becoming popular and advertised tells me that we do have an issue with posture all the time. So I don't know the name of it, but I would, um, research it a little bit sort of a, it's a reminder to kind of sit up straight especially my best advice to you on posture is stand as much as you can so that your body doesn't go lazy your core does not fall asleep because it's so natural to do this too obviously i want to just slouch after i've been sitting tall the whole time so you know, sorry to me that's okay so something that i i always uh hear mention and i try and do sometimes is uh superman pose right uh so for like well wonder whatever i would say like wonder woman right for like women no it, it is wonder woman for women yeah. it's like doing the wonder woman pose like standing in front of the mirror and that helps with your posture and your confidence have you heard of that one before 
oh, that's the whole talk by Amy Cuddy and talking about, so it's not just sitting at your desk. It's, it's what your body says. I want you to think about what happens when you have a win and you cross a finish line, you finish something, you do a project. What happens? What do you do? Janine, what do you do? Uh, you just cross I, that finish line and you did a good run in a 5K or you nailed a project. You came out of a, 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 a meeting. I do, I do a Rocky and put my heart Absolutely, like, yes. Even if it's imaginary, right? I'm just like, I did it. Right, right. We <laughs> tend to do that. This is a powerful move. It has been studied where people that have never seen it, people that are visually impaired, that have never seen anyone do this, they cross a finish line and do this. So it's not that we see each other do this. The postures, as you say, what gives you energy? It's reaching out and taking up more space. It's saying that I am here. And I don't care if you go in the parking garage and you just you know, walk like a boss or walk in or put your hands on your hips or anything that makes you feel open and strong. Remember, you don't want to stand in front of an audience like this, but we, in coaching speaking, we do say, show your palms when you're speaking. Even if you're referring to people, you or me, even in a video call, being open with your, your stand and your posture. But any of those power pauses, heck, I have people that are nervous that do jumping jacks before analyst calls just to get their heart rate up, to get in the game, take a deep breath, have a seat and go. You know, a lot of it, I have a whole newsletter on your, the strength of your core determines uh, the impression that someone makes of you. You really want to have strong core muscles. You can just, again, regardless of your height, by the way. In other words, you're telling me that I need to be able to hold the plank longer. Yes, okay. <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> and engage um, your core. Like I'm going to tickle you. You want to Tighten okay, and, and okay. brace. I'm engaging. I'm engaging. Brace, wow, brace. You like I'm going to take you. You are putting me to work today. Wow. <laughs> okay. So Mark asked, what are some tips for introverts who are sometimes uncomfortable with direct eye contact? Yeah. Remember, Mark, I'm going to take a few notes so that you can stay. And I take this and I do this and I'm writing as you're speaking. And I'm even coming across more attentive versus poker face, just looking at you. Another suggestion, Mark, that I have is, and you need to practice this. If I ask Janine, Janine, ask me a question. I'm going to demonstrate for Mark. Oh, sure. Um, okay. So where is it that you teach again? Yeah. Um, when I think of the place that I teach, maybe I've taught in many places. Let me, let me think about that. So did you see what I did? Of course, I know where I teach, but I take a little bit of time to to demonstrate that I'm listening, we do do a lot of this coaching with listening. I may look upright when you look versus the floor. The floor demonstrates or maybe dictates, especially in standing speaking, that you're nervous. Uh, but you can, huh. you, you can in a virtual call, just kind of like, mm, I'm thinking about this and let me talk about it. And then I'm going to look at my notes and then refer to that. So, Mark, you've got to come up with different ways of doing that. But you you have to... In a, in, a vir in a virtual setting, it's harder. In a real setting, it's easier to turn your eyes somewhere else or look at some other people when they're speaking. This has challenged introverts. I, I know for sure that it's exhausting. So thanks for your question. Thank you for that. Um, okay, Stephen asks, so the apps that you mentioned, are they also in other languages? That's a really good, very good question. I don't think so, although I've had clients that I coach in different languages speak into uh, the Udly app, and I just do it because I can get the video and I can see through it. My recommendation for speaking apps is a transcription app. I use otter.ai because if I want to give a lot of feedback to my students, I talk it and it gives it in a writing and then I give it to them. But you know that if it does not recognize you, that's difficult. Uh, if, if, if a transcription app does not recognize you're speaking, you're mumbling, you may be going too fast, or you're not articulating. So if you can get a transcription app in whatever language, you will get that feedback too. That is a really good question. I don't know the answer to that, and I'll find out for next time that I get it. But that, that's actually really good to know that if you're using a transcription app that, you know, if yeah. it doesn't record what you're saying, it's for those reasons. 
So yes. that's, you know, that's a really good point. Okay. Yeah. And transcription apps exist in many different languages for sure. Awesome. Thank you. So I your best sorry. trainer, by the way, with that is Siri, because you can record on the Apple phone in different languages. And if she doesn't understand you, it's going to make a mistake. She's going to make a mistake all the time. And you know that you need to slow down or articulate a little better. Oh, OK. Thank you. I, I never use Siri. Well, you but know, not Siri, you but now. you know, you you do a verbal, do you do verbal text? Like you click and you go, okay, I'm oh, going to be. Yeah, no, I'm not tech savvy. So oh. I'm like, yeah. That's, I, that's I another way to do that. That's another way to do that. Mark is overwhelmed. He's like, stop it with the feedback now. Okay. <laughs> okay. So if I'm pronouncing your name wrong, I apologize. Esha asks, is speaking in, the, in public the only way of improving speech and confidence? I mean, I think you kind of answered that. With well, well, I would say that speaking in private when you are recording yourself with some of these apps, when you lift up the phone and you have a speech to give and you call your mom and you say, I'm going to leave it in a message, and then you play it back and you listen to it, the way to increase or improve speaking competence is also singing in the language. Listen to a lot of the music that you like and play with that. Again, I've, I've written another newsletter, stronger newsletter uh, to, to go along what happens for non-native speakers and tips and tricks. I remember following along on the words of, of vinyl records when I was learning English, because you need to see it and you need to hear it and you need to speak it. And singing is a great way to do that as well. One may say rap is a great language, uh, a music style to, to learn to speak in a different language. You do need to speak it, though, in order to get better at speaking it. It's a specificity uh, uh, training skill. Thank you. Susan asked, what is an effective uh, substitute for saying, you know, when talking to people? How many times have I said, you know? I mean, I use every filler you can possibly imagine. As long as you don't use one all the time, you should probably go on Udly and record a, a practice sign. So, you know, well, the one piece, the, she asked about, so, or, you know, you know, you know, you know, you know, you know, yeah. When you say, you know, all the time, it takes away. I would, what I say is don't replace it with something else. Pause it. So this is a difficult situation and we're going to solve it. Instead of saying, you know, another difficult filler is when people go, uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. And you think you're rushing me, stop it. So listen, get feedback. It may be, if you think you're saying it a lot, you probably are. A replacement for like is such as you decide if you want to do it. Another very common in the United States, and then I also say people that are learning English is the you guys thing that is not very gender neutral. And we say it to a group full of women, you guys. And I always say you all or everyone or us, you know, think of other, you know, as I say, think of other ways. I'm not saying, you know, is a bad filler. It's just when the other person all of a sudden thinks I'm going to start keeping tally marks because I've heard this so many times, you know, you're doing that uh, often. You're so be easy on yourself, but get some data. Back. So you're taking me back um, to, 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 to when I was taking Toastmasters. To Toastmasters. Yes. <laughs> excellent. Excellent resource, by the way. Toastmasters. Yes. And clearly it's a network on me. Okay, um, Helena asks, can you please speak on developing warmth more or provide some reference mm -hmm. items? That's a great question. Yeah, you know, a, a lot of uh, people that some, sometimes and, and quite often it's women because we're told, I was told once by another faculty member, you're being too much of a mom. And I thought, you know what? That's who I am. And I'm not gonna not show that I care for the students. So I'm going to find different ways if in case that hurts my competence. Warmth comes from if you can control some of the way that you, instead of being very direct, you know, what are we doing today? You can say, hope my email finds you doing well. Or, it was nice to see you yesterday if it's in writing. But also think about doing that in a face-to-face -face conversation. Quite often, if you are considered or not warm enough, warm enough, think of how do you build rapport 
but not do it with seeming that you're wasting the person's time. Making an introductory, introductory comment or remembering something that you said conversed with, with the person from the previous time to bring up. So making it a little bit more relational. I'd have to, Elena, speak to you more individually, write me a question on LinkedIn in, in uh, the private messaging so we can talk about it. I'm wondering if it's verbal on the phone, if it's face-to-face, -face, if it has to do with eye contact, if you're a very direct person, uh, quite often the warmth is what is measured. By the way, the research says that leaders more than anyone else are need to communicate warmth more than anyone else, uh, as, as they, especially when they face challenging situations. I could go on and on with having a whole talk on warmth, but that's a really good question. Thank you. Okay, Anonymous asked, how might one recover after making a gaffe or word salad in public? <laughs> I've made so many of those, my friend. Again, trusting yourself, uh, owning up to it. I was in a meeting once and I said, we can't pound a dead dog and it's beat a dead horse. Wrong <laughs> verb, wrong animal. Horrible, horrible. English is not my first language. Gridlock, deadlock, and woodlock. Why on earth do you make three words that are so darn similar? And even 35 years in this country, I still make questions. I would just laugh it off. If you tend to make a word gaffe, try not to copy what you hear. So I should never have tried the, it's like beating a dead dog, or I made up the animal and the verb because it's not mine. And I didn't, I copied it. And in the process of being nervous and speaking, I botched it up. So try not to use any idioms because you can get those wrong. I would say, try to keep it clean and simple. And if you slip, just to say, I'm sorry, my English is not there yet. Or just to say, I didn't mean to say that. So own up to it. Don't worry about it. So I always botch up uh, idioms. And I wonder if it's because, I don't know about you, but English was in my first language. So I wonder if that's why. Yes. Putting up, putting off, putting on, putting in. What the heck? There's everything has a different meaning and it's exhausting. So it, try not to, not, to, not to say them at all. <laughs> They're great though, right? They're like really great emphasizers. I just wish that when I do mess them up, someone would tell me. So then I'm like, okay, then I'll get it. I know, I know. Right next time. <laughs> yeah. Okay, David asked, all right, this is kind of similar to the question that uh, Helena asked about warmth. So thank you so much for this, for this presentation. My question oh. is, my team meets via Teams uh, with cameras off. So I really don't see people's faces and they don't see mine. How mm. can I come across as warm in an environment like that? Uh, can, I would recommend if she can turn her, her camera on and just stick to that so she's communicating. Because if you make a joke, you're in a way, you, you say something that comes across that is um, funny, but not funny, or you're teasing and they don't see your face, they can take it wrong. So if you can control it, and if you're the manager and you just say, look, I'm more comfortable keeping my camera on, do it. Now, I'm going to assume you think you're saying, ah, that's not going to happen. I would audio tape yourself to hear how you come across, how conversational you are how relational you are and ask for some feedback. You can say, I just watched a, I participated in a warmth and competence seminar. I'd like to know I'm trying to, to communicate with more competence or more warmth. Can you tell me what you heard? So ask someone that you trust for feedback that they have. I do recommend the Udly app that I'm a super fan of has just started a program where you can enable it in your Zoom meeting. So you're not finally going in and practicing your speaking, but it's catching you when you're speaking in a meeting. Now, it has to be in a setting where there's no confidential uh, information that everyone knows, but it's a great way to get feedback on your impromptu speaking uh, on without it being prompted. I find it to be a great tool. They, they, the creators are just wanting to create opportunities for all of us to get coaching in our speaking all the time. And the more we can do that, the better. Awesome, thank you. Okay, Omar asked, how do you improve body language? Yeah, it has to be intentional, Omar, at times. For me, 
This is the biggest gesture that I try to teach my students. If you say, in my opinion, for me, my story, hand to chest, there's certain gestures that go with that. And part of it is at times practicing with something that's by your head, if you hand when you're standing, and then remembering to gesture with one hand, even if you hold it closed in the beginning versus being able to connect and relate specifically. Body language a little bit at a time. Remember, Omar, in the very beginning, I said a lot of presence comes from authenticity. Don't try to be someone that you're not because you will not be happy and you will look fake in that way. So when I work with people that I coach, first, I want to talk with them and to see what their tempo is like. And then we come up with a couple of movements that they do that fits their personality without being overly exaggerated and animated. So you may need a couple of gestures and a couple of them may be counting. You know, that's an easy one or talking about a faraway project that's specific to your speaking without having to gesture too much. Thank you, Omar. I use my hands quite a bit. Um, I use, like, I talk with my hands. It's okay. It's okay. It's you. I, yeah, it is. And I feel like at this point in my life, I'm probably not going to change that. Um, <laughs> so back to hands. The last question that we have is from AJ. Can you please repeat what is the best thing that we should do with idle hands in a personal conversation? Face to face or virtual? Have them tell us. Uh, let's say face to face. Okay. So in face to face, you want to, I'm going to lean into and, uh, um, uh, proprioceptive, new, oh shoot, um, NLP, neuromuscular uh, linguistic, uh, what does NLP stand for? Oh, if you caught me at the end of my day, um, you can Google it real quick, Janine, and help me. But NLP says that you wanna mirror the energy of the person that you're speaking with. So if you're speaking to someone who's uh, pretty much standing and is leaning here and hands are clasped, you don't wanna be, going on like this in a one-on-one -on -one. if you're talking to someone it. but what is it's it natural language processing thank you thank you so you're matching you're mirroring the person you're not doing this if the person is leaning back you want to be leaning back a little bit or if they have both hands on the table at least have one hand on the table remember i said it's all about audience so your body language should be open again you don't want to be sitting like this unless you're thinking and you're and you're processing and that's a little bit of part of what you're doing but not the entire time so you need to match where the audience is and again do what's natural for you awesome Thank we're you. at the top of the hour janine and i know we did it 700 Yay! people still going at it strong good thank job you. good job okay so i want to thank everyone that joined us today this was a really really great event and tatiana thank you so much i cannot wait to watch this recording with that said <laughs> For those of you that join later that want to watch, uh, that asked about the slides, you can watch a recap and recording of this event uh, on our Community Matters blog at meetup.com slash blog. And if you want to get in touch with Tatiana, uh, we shared the links on chat and we will reshare them again so that you can have them. Um, yeah, thank you everyone for joining. I hope you had as much fun as I did. And Tatiana, thank you for making me work. Um, I, I want to find the little heart to put at the top because I want to say thank you for all, but I can find this to raise my hand. Really, honestly, coming in for a webinar where you can't ask questions live and interact. And so many of you, I am humbled and honored and very grateful. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day. Bye-bye. <laughs>